This lecture is on wooden structures at the Great Otten Temple at Amarna. It's presented by Barry Kemp for the Amarna Research Foundation, recorded September the 23rd, 2023. Hello, I'm Barry Kemp, the director of the British Mission to Tel Amarna. And I want to talk about the architecture of the Great Aten Temple. The temple has been the focus for much of my energy and that of several of my co-workers since 2012, when we began a major new study of the, of the site. Each year, the area of ground that we have cleaned, excavated, recorded, and restored has grown. But along with the addition of new knowledge goes reflection on the meaning of what we have found. This lecture is a piece of such reflection. Its main theme is post holes, not only holes for wooden supports for canopies and tents, but also holes for posts more the size of telegraph poles. Wooden posts, in fact, have found turned out to be a major feature of the archaeology of the, of the temple. And it's become an increasing puzzle as to why they were there, seemingly often for quite short periods, but nevertheless making a major contribution to the appearance of the site. We first became aware of them at the very beginning in the season of spring 2012. We divided our forces, as it were, between an investigation at the very front of the temple, a good place to start, but also towards the, the back, the place where earlier excavators had found the remains of a large steeler. This was a part of the site which is known also from pictures of the temple in a few of the rock tombs. They agree in showing a picture of a statue of Akhenaten seated in front of or beside a pedestal supporting a round-topped object, which we all agree was a stealer, and then beside it a rectangular courtyard, a slaughter court for oxen and for almost certainly geese. Here you see the slaughtered animals beside tethering stones. The reclearance of the site was mostly a very satisfactory experience because it confirmed that the archaeology is very similar to the pictures in the tombs. Towards the top of the picture here, visible at this stage only as a shallow trench, is the corner of the slaughter court. Subsequently, we have excavated along these trenches and an area inside and confirmed that there was a brick wall there with a gateway, and we even found the remains of a very eroded tethering stone. And then beside it, areas of gypsum concrete, standard foundation material for stonework, two parts in fact. There is this three pronged, seemingly three pronged uh, area but part of it is, is lost, which are the foundations for a low platform, which must be where the statue of the king, and we found pieces of other statues, there was more than one statue there. Uh, this is the platform for royal statues, and beside it, a T-shaped foundation comprising two parts, uh, a thick rectangular top, and a smaller attached rectangle, almost certainly, uh, the foundations for a flight of steps leading up to uh, a solid platform which supported the, the, the steeler. But in addition to these features which confirm the appearance of the, this area of the temple in the tombs, in, in the tomb pictures, there's a, a further uh, unit, a further little building of mud brick, a rectangle, quite small, surrounded by very large post holes. 
originally the post holes would have completely surrounded the rectangle. Uh, we didn't complete the excavation, but we found traces on the surface of the marks which would complete the uh, surrounding of the platform with, with holes. And here, just like this later stage of excavation of that picture are some of the poles, and you can see the post holes, and you can see how large they are. These could support something like telegraph poles around the, around the rectangle. And the plan in detail shows the mud brick rectangle, which faced in the opposite direction to the stone support for the steeler. This is suggested by brickwork here, which presumably is the, the beginnings of uh, a tiny stairway going up to this platform, which is probably not very high. And it seems to be quite dwarfed by the posts that would have surrounded it. Now, one possibility is that they were posts for uh, an elaborate sunshade, essentially. Sometimes they're called older kids, a sunshade which would have covered the place where the king and maybe the king and queen themselves uh, sat. The posts could have been covered with gold and the whole thing could have been very ornate. This lovely reconstruction comes not from Amarna sources, but from work done at Nalkata a few years ago. But it gives a, a model, gives us a model for what might have been, but perhaps it's also too slender and elaborate, our poles would have been much thicker than this. And uh, the, the king, if that's how we understand it correctly, would have sat here, therefore. Uh, his view um, very much between the, these very large posts, which would have come around the front and around the other three sides. As to what was going on here, the holes themselves, of course, no trace of the wood, but the holes themselves contained um, quite a lot of pieces of incense at, at the bottom. Incense which accompanied um, the, um, the, the worship of gods of, of ceremonies and suggests therefore that uh, there are the incense stands here with uh, incense being put on to cleanse the air and give the odor of sanctity that the Egyptians thought uh, was so suited to, uh, to tem temples and, and temple worship. So that was our introduction to post halls at Amarna. It left us without really a very convincing explanation as to what they, they were. Uh, they're a surprising addition to uh, temple architecture, except, of course, in traditional temples and with the Great Aten Temple, there were tall flagpoles at the front of pylons. But these don't serve that purpose. They are self-standing independent uh, ones, but of course flagpoles with colored streamers of cloth on, on the top, mice, they are uh, one option as to the original appearance of these. They might have been freestanding poles with colored streamers flapping in the wind. More or less at the same time, we started to work at the front of the temple. And here you have the mud brick enclosure wall. It enclosed a huge area, almost 800 meters from uh, front to, to back, uh, with a pair of mud brick pylons and a ramp leading up. At this point, I should uh, point out, but and perhaps you all know this already from, from our work, that the pylons and the small stone palace behind, and also the huge stone temple, which I, I'm inclined to call the long temple, because that's what it was, that these stone features and the brick pylons were not the first Amarna period buildings there. <clears throat> they represent an enlargement of an earlier layout from the early years of occupation, of Amarna, um, probably starting in year 12. We got that from uh, a wine jar labeled in a trench underneath the stonework. So these are not the first stone buildings here, but it's an important thing to take into consideration because when they were built, the ground towards the front of the temple was raised a little bit, about 70 centimeters, in order to make it more even 
and this buried and so preserved a floor and other features which had been there before from the early years of the, of the temple. Now this rather elaborate plan on the left is that piece at the very front with both periods represented. You can see the mud brick wall passing from side to, to side and the outer ramp going up, but then also an inner ramp going down. This was a temporary expedient for a time when the temple was being built. The ground hadn't yet been fully, fully raised, but shortly this part, everything inside the wall would be buried and a new floor created above, except on the left, this, if you like, is the new, a part of the new floor. It's another piece of gypsum concrete foundation, a support for a stone, a stone palace. Over on the right, you have the details of the earlier floor that have been very well, well preserved. And they are that the building consists of lines of much smaller post halls, which form part of a building in two parts. The other part is over on, on, on the right. And it faces towards the north and towards a line of much larger post holes that were confined to the inside of the, the temple enclosure. We looked at parts of this through excavation over a period of time as gradually we got to understand what was, was going on. Uh, this was a, a this is a picture taken uh, after the site had been completely cleared and then backfilled and then we went back and opened up it up again to get a, a better view of some of the, the details. Here is the, the floor and the mud floor and that wooden post building starts here and then runs underneath the protective layer of sand that we put down. And here is the side wall of the, the ramp. It's been filled in now, we've backfilled it. And over on the left, you can't really see it now, are, are the gypsum concrete foundations for the, um, for, for the uh, stone, little stone palace. Also filled in, a little bit difficult to see, are these very large post holes that run in a line beside the, um, the, the ramp wall, although the ramp wall came later and replaced the, the wooden poles. But here's one, and here's a group of three, and there are two more uh, further, further inwards. I show this picture because it shows after it had been cleared, it shows a feature which we had not properly understood and had actually appeared in more than one phase of the excavation. It's the edge of a little mound covered with a clay or mud brick surface. It's then been broken up. Uh, but these three poles emerged from uh, a low mound. This is the mud surface itself before we realized that these that some of these poles were here. Uh, is, here is the uh, basis for the base for the, uh, the stone palace. It's defined by rows of post holes, which must represent the remains of, not of walls, but of, of screens. It's a mixture of wooden posts and screens, either of canvas, canvas or, 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 or matting. And it shows that the, the depth beneath the <clears throat> original, beneath the floor of the, the temple in its later phase, it's about 70 centimeters from bottom to top. And here it's the whole um, uh, complex is rendered in a single uh, simplified plan. This is the remains of a mud brick pedestal which had been uh, erected towards the front of this building. The post holes define uh, an outer part and then it continued further back to include a, 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 a rear part. And it looks out towards, well, we don't know what was here because it was later covered by the um, stone palace on its own foundations. But just short of that stone palace uh, was a row of much larger post holes, including this group of three emerging from a low brick mound, a low mound of sand, sorry, covered with a thin layer of mud brick. 
We've had various goes at visualizing it. This is a three dimensional uh, rendering, the start of three dimensional rendering by photogrammetrist Paul Doherty. And here you can see uh, the little mud brick platform. I have invented a little set of stairs on, at the back and also put three at the front for a reason I'll explain shortly. And you can see the, yes, the way in which the, the poles defined the edges of a larger tented structure, a tented structure which seems to have been put up more than once because some of the holes seem to be duplicated and a, a structure where the supports for um, flexible walls have not been put, were put in with any degree of accuracy. They've been lined up by, uh, by eye. And this became the basis for uh, Paul to try to build up experimentally uh, the idea of uh, a mud brick building, which could have been for a short time uh, the king's palace, a little temporary, temporary palace. And he's uh, used his knowledge of Egyptian architecture to pictures of such places, which sometimes show a, a rounded roof, a, a curving roof. So this is the a framework for the main part with the mud brick pedestal with uh, its own canopy, uh, much less uh, heavily made than the one I showed you shortly. And well, for the three mud brick, for the three poles on the little mud brick mound, he's made a second little canopy here, which I think is, uh, is not necessary. The reason for thinking that it's a place where the king came to is that in one of the post halls, when we cleared it, uh, cleared the site very carefully, a number of pieces of painted gypsum plaster emerge, emerged. Now, painted plaster, almost certainly from a floor, is found at Amana only in buildings uh, which were palaces or places where the, the, the king came to be present. It took us a little while to figure out what these designs were, but eventually with, with help from outsiders, we worked out that these fragments come from a very large scale figure of a foreign captive, a Nubian captive. And here are the, the pictures. There are lots of models to draw from. Um, particularly from, from Theban tomb paintings. Uh, and the painted uh, bottom part of uh, a seat in rushwork from the tomb of Tutankhamun. So we're fairly, once you've got a small number of, of pieces, the rest of the design follows and the pieces we have give you, uh, the, give you the, the scale. And the next step beyond this is to utilize some of the larger representations of paintings of captives, one of them from one of the floors, one of the gypsum, part, gypsum plastered floors with paintings found by Petrie in the late 19th century in the Great Palace. And we know that it tells us that these figures of captives were uh, in groups separated by groups of bows. This is our Nubian I put him in, and I borrowed from uh, the pictures of the uh, Great Palace painting, uh, an Asiatic, somebody from Palestine, Syria area. And uh, also the, the way in which, at least in that painting, the figures are reversed alternately. So we have to imagine a building with this uh, painting uh, from the floor uh, in which the king, when he walks over it, the short distance, perhaps just at the, the, the top of a short flight of stairs, he's actually walking on his enemies. He's trampling them. And so Paul, uh, in another one of his renderings, there's, there are quite a lot more to come. We're still working on it, but he's inserted the, uh, the painting here and a little seat where the king could sit and presumably figures who came to greet him uh, approach from this side, which is, which is the north, and in coming up towards him, uh, they would be humbling Egypt's enemies, or the king would come up, stand up and walk uh, a few steps to, to trample on his, his enemies. And here it is with the little 
figures of um, uh, captives uh, placed on. Uh, there's enough evidence to show that this was a, a mud brick platform and uh, the line of very large post holes, this group of three, um, which, em which emerged from um, a low mound of, of sand, which had been plastered over with uh, mud plaster and included, included some mud bricks. It's odd that it's to one side. You might have expected this to be the focal point of a run of poles uh, equal on either side. And it doesn't really articulate at all with the uh, with a little uh, square pedestal, perhaps because you were looking at more than one period. But I was struck by the overall agreement, the overall picture of Little Palace runs of poles uh, on seeing some years ago, noticing some years ago, uh, a plan from one of the Chicago Medina Tarbu volumes. The Medina Tarbu Harbour volumes are mainly about the Temple of Ramesses III, but the Chicago expedition working in the 1930s also took in a site beside it, uh, the site of a mortuary temple of King I, which was then taken over and developed further by, by Hor and Heb. It was mostly a stone temple, but the stone part had been completely removed, which was in a way fortunate for, for us because it revealed uh, features from uh, the, the bottommost level, including uh, a, a very rich set of foundation deposits, about which I'll uh, say a little bit later on. Now, here you have a mud brick pylon uh, with a ramp going up, so reminiscent of what we have at the Great Atom Temple. And over on the left, uh, a mud brick building, which is almost certainly a small palace for, for I. Come uh, uh, whereas at Amana we have the same thing, roughly the same size, uh, made from stone on a gypsum concrete foundation. And then behind uh, the beginning of the stone temple itself, but virtually none of the stone remaining at all, just trenches where there, there have been walls plus uh, foundation deposits. And then running across the, the, the front parallel lines of post holes. The one on the left seems to have been put up more than once. You can see how the holes are, are, are duplicated. It's a remarkably close parallel to what we have at the Great Atom Temple. That leaves one asking, what were the posts for? You can see, by the way, that they're likely to have been there before the pylon, the brick pylon was built, because there are more of them here, as if the lines were continuous, uh, perhaps the poles taken down and the uh, pylon built a, a little bit little bit later. The archaeologist or the architect who did the excavation and wrote the report, Rufu Hosha, um, was clearly uh, thinking of the colonnade at Luxor, where you have giant columns of sandstone uh, linking the front to the rear part of Luxor Temple, but these are much more modest. And he talks about this as a, as a colonnade, as if it was a monumental thing, but uh, they, these are much smaller than that. Uh, the holes are smaller than the ones we have at the back of the Great Atom Temple, but I suppose more uh, in line with the, with the holes uh, associated with the little wooden palace that I've just shown you. Now, did the poles just stand there on their own, perhaps with wooden with cloth streamers at the top? This was thought of as, uh, for a time, a, a, a dignified way of uh, enclosing a tiny space in front of the palace where the king would appear. Uh, it's thought that the king had a window of appearance. But if you look into the sources for Egyptian architecture, you can actually find uh, another explanation. Well, I already mentioned that in front of pylons, tall poles were erected, which had color colored streamers. But from early in uh, the uh, history of Egyptian architecture, right down to a very late periods, uh, some festivals, particularly the King's Said festival, festivals, tall poles were 
uh, brought out, which had images of gods on the top. They are standards. Sometimes the standards are shown being carried by men, implying that they weren't that tall, but here they seem to be standing independently and they have a name collectively. They are the followers of Horus. Here's the word followers, the followers, and here's the picture of Horus. And um, the, the hieroglyph for God is there. So these are gods, they're divine standards. And as I say, they go back to uh, early days, to, 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 uh, to uh, break the early periods of, of Egypt. This is quite a late example. It's from the Festival Hall of, of Sorkon at Bubastis, so well after the end of the New Kingdom. The pictures of standards like, like this recur from time to time. Closer to the Amarna period is this one, rather damaged. damaged. It's from the tomb of the 18th dynasty official Heruef at Western Thebes from the reign of uh, Amenhotep III. And it shows bits from Amenhotep, one of Amenhotep III's said festivals, Jubilee festivals. The king is here, although you can't really see it. It's been very heavily damaged, but you can see figures of where well, they're identified as priests. Here's the hieroglyphic group priest uh, carrying Two of these standards, one with Horus, one with Thoth, and more of them up here. The one at the front, the leading figure, uh, has a standard with a canine god uh, who's identified as Wet And a reference here to Hierakompolis, to, to, to Nechen, um, a, very, a very direct link to what, what the Egyptians realized, what they knew was one of the earliest kingdoms that Egypt had, had produced. Now, this is Amenhotep III, so Akhenaten had not yet uh, taken his place on the stage, but the sandstone blocks from Akhenaten's early work at Karnak includes uh, blocks from a said festival scene, and a jubilee scene, which includes figures carrying the same standards. And here they are in a rather simpler form uh, with the, uh, the canine god, uh, the, the figures, the hieroglyphs would say priest and, uh, and uh, Horus, and this rather odd design, like a, uh, an, an, an enshrouded uh, object. So these are possibilities to bear in mind. The poles may not have been just blank. Uh, they might have borne symbols, but if so, they're introducing wider ideas. These um, symbols, uh, the, these standards, uh, belong with the celebration of the King's Set Festival. There has been much argument as to whether Akhenaten celebrated any set festivals, any jubilee festivals at Amarna. Uh, the general view is that no, he didn't because the evidence is insufficient. And the appearance of large post holes is still not really sufficient, but one has to bear in mind uh, possibilities. And now I want to get on to if you like, the, the core part of my talk, a revelation that came to me quite recently. The rear part of the temple, packed into a limited space, a large number of offering tables and small rooms, leaving behind an intricate plan marked on the original foundation. We have planned the rear part of the temple at the scale of 1 to 25. This allows much detail to be included. I realized only fairly recently that incorporated into the plan are many places where circular holes have been cut into the foundation layer, here colored gray. They have been plastered over so that they are easily, so that they easily escape notice. Here they are marked in red. We can't break open the, the concrete where most of these, these holes are visible. It's thick, it was doing terrible damage to the, uh, to, to, to the ancient structure. But fortunately, it isn't necessary. The, as you can see from the previous uh, slide, the previous picture, the concrete had been broken up a lot. 
uh, in ancient times when the temple was uh, demolished. And parts of the concrete layer, the foundation layer, had been cut into with an intention, it seems, of removing it completely, but then that was uh, abandoned. And so we have several places where the line of breakage runs across the middle of one of these holes, so you can actually get a section through it. Here's the concrete at the top and the hole going down, which has then been filled up with sand and there's a shirt, a few pieces of lump mud, mud and gravel and quite a thick capping of fresh gypsum concrete over the top and it's all then been plastered over so it's uh, it was flat. This is one case where you get uh, an idea as to when in the building sequence this was done. Uh, on the left there are the scars from stone blocks showing that a wall man here it's one of the major walls which divides the back of the temple into a series of spaces. Over on this side is a, a light uh, trench, a light groove has been cut into the surface to create a rectangle which marks the position of one of the offering tables to come. And here is the outline of one of the caps to what is in effect a, a large post hole. Here it is. And the groove which makes the lines for the builders to follow in making a new or in making an offering table. The groove actually cuts through the uh, concrete cap of, of the, the pole of the post hole. So this shows that the, the holes and their like a forest of, of posts uh, was put in when this huge rectangular area of gypsum concrete had been laid down. Perhaps the outlines of walls and offering tables have been marked on in ink. If you look very closely here, there's the remains of an ink line from this wall. Then the holes were hacked into the concrete surface, the poles were put in, and then removed and the building started. Uh, the, this offering table uh, clearly hadn't been uh, started at all and must have been built after the poles had been removed. There is another picture uh, which recurs through Egyptian history, another architectural scene which recurs through Egyptian uh, history of foundation ceremonies themselves. This one comes from the fifth dynasty from the solar temple of fifth dynasty King Niusara at Abu Hurab. On the left, the King kneels and makes a foundation deposit. The pit has been cut, meat offerings have been put in, and he's adding uh, to two little, little vessels. And then over on this side, figures are pairs of, of gods are hammering into the ground posts with uh, a cord uh, between them. And this part on, on the right uh, is, is often referred to and often depicted through Egyptian history as the stretching of the cord. And it was the basic um, act in making a new building it's the, the way in which it's sort of, sort of dedicated, it's made into a sacred space. You put up posts and wind a cord around them and imagine that uh, the gods have done this to uh, give their blessing to, to the building. Now these two features, the offerings in, in uh, foundation deposits and the hammering in of, of the posts uh, see, really define foundation ceremonies for Egyptian buildings. Now, some years ago, it was in the 1970s, uh, a scholar, uh, James Weinstein, wrote his PhD on foundation deposits in ancient Egypt and looked very thoroughly at the evidence throughout Egyptian history for foundation deposits. And here's a nice example of one from the Temple of Ai and Horeb Heb that I uh, talked about talked about before when the stone temple was demolished 
the demolishers left undisturbed in the ground quite a number of foundation deposits, which were therefore recovered in a very, uh, in, in very good state of, of preservation. Uh, there was remains of food offerings, and some of the food offerings were rendered in uh, the form of little faience clerks. Here, these are faience clerks showing trussed oxen and the decapitated heads of oxen and the haunches of, of beef, and then come a, a little models of the tools that would be used in making a, a temple. Here's a, a ball of twine around a, a spindle, and then at the bottom, very helpful for for it for us um, are little cartouche shaped clocks with the name of I in King Aferu I in hieroglyphs. So we have no doubt about the date and uh, an interesting uh, picture of the, um, the materials that were used to make the temple itself rendered in miniature scale in the foundation deposits. Now, now Weinstein, who made this detailed study of uh, foundation deposits, looked at the Amarna period, the, the evidence from Amarna, and decided that there was really no evidence at all for foundation deposits from uh, the buildings at Amarna. And it seems to me he was quite right. Um, when we first, uh, when I first noticed the these uh, cement covered holes in the in the pavement. Uh, my first thought was maybe there are foundations under foundation deposits underneath. But where we have looked at sections uh, preserved through the uh, damage to the temple, there's no trace of anything in the holes. There, there's no sign, no examples of little faience plaques or uh, other material. Uh, in the debris, Pendlebury didn't find anything like this, nor did Petrie for that matter. And our own work has included the, the very careful re-excavation and sieving of some of, or many of Pendlebury's dumps. And we get hundreds of pieces of carved stone that uh, his men threw away, but nothing like this. So I think one can say uh, the negative evidence is pretty strong that the Great Atom Temple, its foundation was not accompanied by the a deposit of foundation deposits, which leaves the post holes. Here they are. I've picked them out in red and removed the architectural background. I've added a few more in blue, where it's clear that the pattern is was a, symmetrical, although, although not rigidly so. Uh, and you have in the center. Um, a, a fairly well-defined rectangular space. Here I've drawn it out separately, 4.25 meters across and 10 and a half meters long. Not particularly large, but nevertheless occupying uh, a crucial space at the back of the temple. Uh, the temple seems to have, or the foundations, been surrounded by a continuous fence. And then other alignments of poles also cross. And this brings to mind, uh, again, the, uh, the scenes of at the beginning of uh, temple ceremonies, the beginnings of making a temple of hammering in posts. And of course, we've got lots and lots of them of, of hammered in posts uh, from the Great Aten Temple. But after they've been hammered in, they were taken out again. So it's a temporary construction of posts. What was so attractive about posts? Well, there was a theme in Egyptian architecture which goes back to the late pre-dynastic that uh, important buildings were constructed of posts and screens. We do actually have from the late pre-dynastic period examples of those, but they became um, uh, sort of cemented, solidified in Egyptians' minds into real limestone architecture, best known at the, the Step Pyramid, uh, or at least the building surrounding the, the Step Pyramid, which would have been open and visible to Egyptians of the late 18th dynasty. I've not, good one, have visited uh, the place and, and seen it. 
there are large numbers of buildings which were, if you like, dummy buildings. They're simulacra. They're, they're not hollow. There's nothing inside except solid fill, rubble. But they've been given a, a, a covering of uh, limestone blocks, beautifully carved with architectural scenes, which depict buildings of posts and matting although the posts themselves have been rendered as if they're tall, single reeds, uh, single pieces of plant material, whereas uh, I'm sure that they're intended to be, um, it's, a, it's a decoration of a solid wooden form. And here's one of the beautiful reconstruction drawings by Jean-Philippe Loer, who spent much of his life recording the uh, architecture of the, the step pyramid, uh, it's a variant of uh, a type of building of which there are several exa different uh, examples at, at the Step Pyramid of buildings which are constructed from tall, slender wooden posts supporting a curving roof, although with straight uh, edges with sometimes round, rounded, rounded sections. And uh, the upper part is open, but the lower part uh, is closed off with a screen with knotted grasses along the top, uh, again emphasizing that this is a, an architecture of uh, organic plant material. Loewe was very proud of his reconstruction work. He looked at the individual blocks very carefully and concluded that at the tops of uh, the vertical of the post, there were places where something wooden had been inserted. There's a hole and a little support. And um, uh, another architectural scholar at the time in, in the 1930s, I, I think, uh, when reviewing Loewe's work, thought that there might have been uh, the representations of the followers of Horus there, that you could imagine, uh, say, uh, a canine god emerging uh, from it, standing on the, on a, uh, a on a horizontal bar. So, so we have that as a model that might have been in the mind of Akhenaten and, and his architects in, in drawing out all of the, um, the, the, those uh, complicated uh, arrangement of posts in the beginning. I said that this style of architecture goes back to very early times. The Egyptians themselves imagined a very remote early time, uh, perhaps the time when creation happened and uh, Egypt was a swampland with um, buildings of uh, wood and, and, and matting being, being created where uh, the gods would be, you know, from relatively recent uh, excavations that in the late pre-dynastic period, there really was a time when important buildings were constructed from wooden posts and, and screens, continuous screens. This is a section of one of the very late pre-dynastic areas at, at Hierapolis, site HK7. Uh, it's partly a cemetery, and some of the burials were of animals, a fascinating uh, sign of, of beliefs at the time. And in a part of the site beside it uh, are several examples of slightly irregularly uh, made uh, buildings um, with, uh, with, with a forest of wooden posts on the inside, presumably supporting a roof. Was the roof flat or was it curved, as in that step pyramid example? And so this, um, from, from our you know, modern uh, research, is roots, in, roots into reality, this idea that the Egyptians had that once upon a time, far in the past, perhaps when the gods were still alive, uh, that, that there had been a time uh, when uh, proper buildings, serious buildings, were wooden posts of wooden posts and matting screens. So is this what was really uh, in the minds of Akhenaten and his architects trying to recreate something like this at the Great Atlan Temple? Why would they do that? Well, my last picture is actually a quotation from the boundary stele. Uh, the boundary stele come in two forms, or they bear two different 
uh, text, uh, the early proclamation and the later proclamation, the late proclamation. And here is a, a sentence from the early proclamation in which Akhenaten himself is speaking. And he refers to the place that he's creating, Akhetaten, the horizon of the disk. And he describes it as Akhetaten is his, that is the Atans, place of the primeval occurrence, which he made for himself. And uh, hieroglyph readers can see it in hieroglyphs, it's in transliteration set F. And Septepi is Ahed Atom, his place of the primeval occurrence or simply the, the first occurrence. It's a reference to primeval times as early as you can go. And uh, Ahed Atom, this is what Ahed Atom is. It is, the, it is the original home for Akhenaten. In other words, Akhenaten is creating for the Atom the kind of place with great historical depth, which other gods had, in particular the gods of Thebes. Uh, in the early years of his reign, when he was building Aten temples at Karnak, he was building them uh, in a place, uh, the city of Thebes, which had this characteristic of being the original primeval place, the place of the first occasion for the god Amun. And now the Aten is getting its own, uh, uh, ultimately ancient place. And perhaps this is what there, then is in, in the mind of Akhenaten and what the Great Aten Temple was all, all about. It was to become uh, the temple for the cult of the, of the Aten uh, with huge amounts of offerings being laid out and increasingly, I believe, a place also where the people of the city would swarm into from time to time and had access to places of offering and celebration of their, of their own. But before this happens, it is rooted to the spot with ceremonies uh, in a, a style of early architecture, which was to be transient. Uh, the, the, it, it's, it, it all starts out with an attempt to recreating wooden architecture, probably appropriate uh, ceremonials, uh, the, uh, the original ancient home of, of the sun god. And I hope that is clear to, to people. Um, I've been working this out in my, my head for a, a little time, and I can imagine some people are a bit skeptical. It's just post holes, uh, but uh, I, I think they have considerable meaning and help us to understand um, you know, what Akhenaten was thinking, but they also leave a void in our understanding of Egyptian temples. We know about this only because, if you like, it's the accident of the way in which the temple was constructed, only because we have still most of that initial spread of gypsum concrete, which has preserved these, um, the, 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 these post holes with the pattern of wooden architecture. What about Karnak? There's no chance of any equivalent uh, evidence. We will probably never know if Akhenaten was reinventing something that hadn't been carried out, hadn't been done for generations, or whether this was the norm still for temples in the New Kingdom, but that a short early phase of creating uh, wooden buildings by knocking in the posts and stretching the core. They, the evidence hasn't survived. It can't have survived because the, the, the architects hadn't introduced, first of all, this seems, still seems to be unique for, for Amana. Uh, there's these huge spreads of gypsum concrete which preserve the first steps in building the temple. Well, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Barry. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, if you'd like to support Barry's work, at, uh, you can go through the Amarna Research Foundation, www.theamarnaresearchfoundation.org. Thank you.